Hi, uh, it's Richard Miller of r &M Miller. I've been asked just to put a recording together just to kind of summarize what we did uh, in our online presentation uh, recently with the Pakistan Agricultural Guild uh, Society. Essentially, the, the presentation was headed farming with feathers. That's because my family, uh, in our background, our wider heritage, we are farmers. And we have applied the skills and the knowledge of uh, livestock management and uh, stockmanship generally uh, to my regard. We feed them with the livestock, we manage the stud, which is hugely important, like livestock. Uh, and we uh, match pedigrees and they carry in exactly the same way. Um, we try and breed exhibition budget regards, not paper budget regards, those are birds that can be bred and exhibited throughout the world and admired throughout the world. Um, and we feel that we have a lot to share, which is why I participate in Facebook generally, and why I was absolutely delighted to participate in the online lecture that we gave. Uh, and quite frankly, as long as I can reach inside a breeding cage and pull out a youngster like that, and breed in excess of 700 birds um, of this quality per year, so I'll be extremely happy indeed. And I thank the mayor that we have a lot to share. Uh, we have a lot to learn as well, but we have a lot to share. And it's only through uh, Facebook and uh, other online mediums uh, that we can do that around the world. So I would like to say thank you very much once again. And to wish everyone the very best of the season ahead. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Richard Miller and um, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed for inviting us today to give an online presentation. The first part of the presentation is going to go through a PowerPoint uh, which I've put together uh, in the summer of last year and then we'll uh, take a short break and move into the Avery and do a live feed from there. All right. So the heading of our presentation is Farming with Feathers. The reasoning behind that is that for many generations, my family were uh, pedigree farmers, highly respected in the United Kingdom. Uh, my father didn't farm, he, he went into commercial property uh, and was very successful from there. So uh, basically my father and I have uh, used budget regards and pedigree budget regards as a means of farming and we've applied many of the principles that top livestock people from around the world use on a daily basis. We've applied that to budget regards and that's pretty much been the foundation of our stud. So these are the men behind the birds. So it's a partnership of two equal halves, as I say, although my father does the vast majority of the work. Um, uh, the photo on the left was taken uh, recently at the World Championship show. And the photo on the right was taken moments after my father and I were confirmed as uh, winning the World Championship show, best in show for the second time. This is my father in the Avery. As you will know, is a bit of a star of YouTube these days for his feeding regime videos and things like that. The key facets to, to uh, my father's uh, uh, involvement, he is a stocksman. He has uh, a vital farming uh, background which allows him to, uh, to run the stud the way he does. He's a perfectionist. Uh, nothing is ever good enough. He's an improviser, so he's always forward thinking, uh, forward thinking and uh, uh, looking for new ideas. He has an incredible knowledge of nutrition and medication, Avery sanitation and show preparation. Uh, a lot of that actually comes, again, from agricultural background, but also uh, from one of our businesses in the poultry industry. He is there 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so he can give them daily care and attention. Then uh, there's myself. I started in the hobby I was eight years old, and you can see here some pictures of me uh, winning rosettes and certificates uh, from a very early age. My uh, qualities, I believe, are I have the eye, also I've been told. This is the ability to identify and isolate features in livestock. Some people refer to it as, as green fingers. You have an instinct and natural ability um, with, with uh, your chosen uh, specialism. I have a pedigree memory. What that means is that I can select a bird out of our flight. I can tell you its grandparents, its great-grandparents, uh, just by looking at it. I need to check the book sometimes. Unfortunately, that means that I, the rest of my mind is pretty much full. So if you, have to, if you tell me to do something, I have to put a diary note or write it down, otherwise I'll forget. My head's just full of butchy stuff. I'm ambitious. 
So I continuously strive for improvement and success in everything that I do, and Butchery Guys is no uh, exception to that. And I'm not there 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I attend the Avery's maybe three times a week, and I believe that gives me an objective eye. It means that I can look at the livestock, and I don't uh, I notice small changes immediately, uh, and that is of great assistance to my father, uh, who sees them every day. Now, if you listen to uh, some rumours, we have several members of staff working for us. That's just a load of rubbish. We have uh, one chap who works with us called Barry Proctor, who also helps run our website. That's just to give my father some support on the day-to-day -day feeding. We have over 700 birds and two aviaries, 96 breeding cages, and that takes some looking after. Um, so uh, I'm sure more will be good from having uh, one chap helping out with the feeding side every now and then. Uh, some people ask us why we have two aviaries, and I'll get on to that. The aviary you're going to see today uh, live is what we call the Young Bird Room. That's where all the youngsters from both, both aviaries uh, move to uh, as the season progresses. It means that we focus on our young birds. We don't get complacent by our adult stock. We judge our success on the last breeding round and nothing more than that. It facilitates round-by-round -round assessment of quality, which means that you can look at an individual flight of birds uh, at a certain age and you can assess them as they move on uh, in that age bracket. I'll explain that in more detail when we go into the area. The second uh, bird room that we have, essentially once the, the, the breeding season is finished, the other birds are moved down uh, into that aviary uh, post, post breeding season, it allows them to recover, uh, take a break from the main aviary. Uh, and the first year that we did this, this was so successful that we decided to just basically pair them up down there, meaning that the, the young bird aviary purely focuses on the current year birds. As I said, uh, it allows the other birds to recover quicker, it prevents young birds from mixing with adults and getting uh, bullied. Uh, and also it means that we can be more experimental in our breeding program for the current year. And the worst season that you should have is the season that you had the year before because your other birds are in April number two doing exactly what they did the year previous. Uh, that's a picture of the, the main Youngstock Avery uh, from outside. It's been extended over the years depending upon uh, our progression of the hobby. That's an external view from another, another angle. That's a view that shows a, a one key feature which my father installed this year. Those are electric shutters which come down at 7 pm every night. It means that we can control the light and also it's an added security uh, feature as well. Okay, so this is uh, a tour directly into the Avery. This was filmed in the summer of 2016. That's our heating system. So we have copper piping linked to an oil boiler going all around the aviary, which gives a consistent heating. Also here you can see everything is on brackets which allows uh, ventilation uh, all around the breeding cages, all around the aviary. There are no hidden areas where mite or disease can hide. Again, clear airspace at the top. A lighting system which is on timer, giving consistency of light all year round.
extractor fans, which are very important for the flow of air through the bird room. And those are the young stock flights. Okay. This is our second aviary, which is located uh, on a, uh, one of our uh, business parks, a self-contained unit, uh, very simple setup, uh, one that will enhance in time, but for the time being, uh, it does the job. Okay, so that's Avery number two. One of the key features in any Avery design is ventilation. So that is the passage of clean air through the Avery at all times. So the ventilation uh, passes through the Avery, uh, mainly from the outside of the Avery, and is pulled through through extractor fans. All the, the main area, as you'll see, is tiled throughout, which um, uh, also adds to the uh, passage of air through. It means it's easier to keep clean as well. The breeding and stock cages, you will have noticed, are all on brackets, which means that they can be removed from the aviary, and also it facilitates uh, circulation of air uh, all around them. The aim is to provide a constant flow of clean air, which is exceptionally good for the bird's health, and also it's very good for your health because you spend a lot of time in there. That's just a, a photo there showing the heating system, the copper piping that goes all around the main aviary and the brackets we refer to. This is a short video which will just show you a, an example of the strength of the airflow coming through the aviary from the main door. So you'll see that even when the door's shut, there's a flow of air coming in on that side. And that shows you how strong it is coming through the, the vent there as well. I'll be able to show you our uh, breeding cage and nest box design when I go in the aviary and do the live feed from there. But it's not uncommon to what most people have in their aviary. It's a box in a box design uh, made from varnished wood. Uh, it's set on plastic runners, which uh, means it's easy to pop in and out of the box. We don't use concaves simply because we have uh, a nesting system that is known as tropibed as opposed to sawdust. Tropibed is a fantastic system that allows for um, uh, the birds to nest really well themselves without having any kind of uh, uh, concave as uh, being necessary. So that's a typical breeding cage. I'll just set the video off now so you can see the simple nest box design.
the electric shutters which I showed you in one of the photos there, as I mentioned before, it controls the daylight hours into the aviary, it prevents disturbance by passers-by, and further secures the aviary as well. These are some better pictures of the uh, shutters in question. So I mentioned the concept of farming uh, with feathers, farming with budgerigars. So there are key elements to how the farm works. Uh, and this is just a slide summarizing those points. I'll go through each of them in more detail, but essentially routine, a feeding regime, a robust feeding regime, outcrossing for features, setting goals, pair selection, the birds themselves, breeding in numbers, having a pedigree production line, as we call it, keeping ahead of the times, and the importance of young birds. So when I talk about the pedigree production line, what I mean is the system that we have about moving birds as they get older from one flight into another, okay? So they start in the baby cages from five to eight weeks, they progress into flight number one, between eight and 12 weeks. Then they move on to flight number two for three and four months old. Flight number three for four and five months old. Flight number four, six months and older. And by that stage, we'll be starting to pair up for the breeding season. Once they complete their first breeding season, they'll then be moved down to the, down to the second Avery. One of the key uh, elements as to why we chose to do this was it, it facilitates what we call round by round assessment of quality. So as far as we're concerned, we're only as good as the last round of breeding. We assess what's going right in that particular breeding round. So we may, for example, have bred lots of birds with super spots, which is great. On the downside, yeah. we, we may have started breeding some with one or two much flecking. What that facilitates is that we are able to then make adjustments in the next breeding pair that we make so as to enhance the, what's going well. So, as I say, the ability to make adjustments in the pairings that you make when you're looking at each particular batch of youngsters is a very, very important part of what we do. We play what we call a numbers game. Anyone who can have uh, six or ten breeding pairs and breed exceptional budgerigars is doing really, really well and, and we'll take our hats off to them. What I do is I look at every breeding cage and I see it as a slot machine, okay? Now what that means, if someone walks into a casino and puts a, a pound into a slot machine, they, they have a very, they have an, you know, a, a, a chance of winning the jackpot. However, if that same person goes into a casino and plays 96 slot machines, over a period of time, that person has a higher percentage of hitting the jackpot than the guy who's just playing the one machine. So we basically be believe in breeding high numbers of birds, high quality pairings, and we take the top slice every time, which means that our birds progress in, in the right direction year after year after year. Jack Coyton from Belgium visited in Holland, came over for a trip last year. And he congratulated us on the improvement in our birds and asked how we'd achieved it. He had been three years previously. I explained to Jack that the reason was since he had been, we had bred over 1,600 youngsters. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, numbers that propel us going forward. So I do believe that where you have the ability to breed budgerigars in bigger numbers, you have an increased probability of breeding super birds. This just goes through some of our numbers. So in 2013, we bred 441 youngsters. In 2014, we bred 511. In 2015, we bred 723. In 2016, by the time of this presentation, which was in the summer, we bred 517, and we ended up with 724. To date, in the 2017 breeding season, having only paired up towards the end of November, we are now on 230 youngsters. So why? Why do we try and breed big numbers? As I hinted with my point about slot machines, it's a game of percentages. 10% of your, if you're breeding with the right quality of birds, 10% of your, your youngsters will be excellent. 20% to 30% will be very, very good. You will then have good to medium after that, 
and then you'll have the lower quality like everyone does. By being able to produce uh, the numbers of birds we do, it means that we have twice as many birds in those top two brackets than what most people will. So it allows us to focus on improving the average and not just the top quality of our birds because we're constantly assessing them and we're constantly breeding birds to replace our, our existing stock. This is a, a really important point. You will come across some aviaries that are, by means of artificial insemination or just sheer luck, they will have uh, a bird, say, five years old that is still breeding, okay? Now, there's certainly some merit in that if it's a super bird and it's producing uh, fantastic youngsters. However, we don't really follow that uh, method. Our belief is that in any breed, any pedigree, the future and the success is in the vitality of youth. So we strongly believe in using as many young birds each year during the breeding program as possible. So we, once the birds are in flight number four, and they show signs of maturity. And when I say signs of maturity, we will uh, look at the general behavior of the bird. We will also see whether the bird has a full iris in its eye. And if all of the traits are matched up, after that bird is six months old and it shows those traits, it will be paired up. The adult birds are moved on to the second day of at the end of their first breeding cycle. So we don't forget about them, we still use them, but we do focus on our young birds. We regard them as more virile and they represent the future of your stud. I can think of some people who have won the world show uh, that we have before and they have the year that they win it. And then the, the following year you look at their young birds and they start going backwards. And unfortunately this can happen. So by focusing on your young stock, you get a real live picture as to where your birds are at that period in time. Don't focus on the past, always focus on the now and the future. One of the other key elements to breeding super birds uh, is to have a routine. The birds don't like to be bothered, they don't like sudden changes in their environment. They like to know what is happening, when it's going to be happening. So fitting in with your working day and other commitments, it's important to make sure that you have a routine that the birds uh, can get used to uh, and understand. So just to give you an idea, our breeding pairs are checked twice per day, once in the morning and once in the early evening before uh, feeding time. We control the light, as you can see, with the shutters that I've shown before. And we also have the lighting system on timer so the night lights uh, come on at 9 p.m. Uh, the main lights go off at 10 p.m. And then the main lights come on again at 7 a.m. the following morning and the night lights go off. The feeding regime, which I'll touch on later, is, is one of the most important things that we do. And the birds are fed soft food all year round, which means that they get the same diet. They use the same diet. There are no fluctuations in what they're fed. Uh, and we believe this is a big part of establishing a routine. Many of you will have seen Michael Miller's uh, videos on YouTube when people have filmed him mixing his soft food mixture. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive, as you can see, uh, and you, as you will have seen on the YouTube videos. But it is essentially everything that a Bajrigar would be able to find for itself in the wild, but just brought into the 21st century with, with, with modern products uh, mixed in together. The birds absolutely love the soft food. And as you can see here on the left, it's ready to go into the breeding cages. And on the right, that uh, is what would, be, what would be placed in a typical flight of birds. Keeping ahead of the times, this is a, a really important point. Um, obviously, if you look at the pictures here, you will see that the, on the left-hand side, there's a pet, pet bird from the wild in Australia. Interestingly, the next bird, a grey green in the uh, early to mid 1990s, that bird won something like six or seven best in shows. That bird was a super budget regard and uh, was very, very successful on the show bench. If you then skip further to the violet that I'm showing you, that's one of our birds. That bird was uh, in 2007 received one vote for best in the agent show at the Madrigal Society World Championship Show. 
Now, as you can see straight away, the difference between the, those two birds is pretty remarkable in a relatively short space of time. If you then look to the next bird, compare the cobalt, comparing that to the violet, say that was a gap of two years. Now look to the cinnamon gray. This, uh, this bird is uh, a bird that we are currently using in the breeding cage, but it's, it's a 2014 bird. As you can see again, the feather quality has moved on. The directional feather is even more robust than it is in the bird to the left. And that just gives you an idea of how important it is to keep with the times, keep ahead of the times, looking forward for new features in budgetary regards. Because you can be the guy who had the grey green there, winning seven best in shows one year and being totally unbeatable, and then in two years' time finding yourself completely out of date and behind the game. Pair selection is very, very important. So we're talking about breeding pairs here. I'll be able to give you some live examples when I'm in the aviary as to some of the pairings that we make, but just to give you some summary points, we always look to pair opposites. So we will never pair an extremely good bird, a uh, cock bird, to an extremely good hen bird. We will never pair buff to buff. I don't see it as being a successful pairing. I often think that, that pairing can produce lesser quality youngsters than the birds themselves. So we never pair best to best. We always really aim to pair super visual cockbird to say a lesser well-bred typey hen. And we believe this facilitates what we call a complementary pairing. We match features as all breeders do, and I'll talk through some of those later. But we also bear in mind pedigree first. So what the birds have been bred from, their family traits are all taken into consideration as and when we make a pairing assessment. So for example, a, fleck, a bird that has flecking will, will be paired to a clean-headed bird, but we will check that that clean-headed bird has a history of, uh, of, of clean birds in its family. It won't be paired to a bird that has a fault on the same family line. So this is a, a good example of a, a very well-matched pair that produced some super youngsters for us. This was in the 2010 breeding season. So we had, uh, these birds were both 50% Alan Marchin, bred from separate pairings, a light green cock masking yellow face that was just starting at that point in time to show some of the features that we were wanting to breed into the birds that the Huxley and Marchant line had established. He was probably a little bit short on mask. The sky blue hen had depth of mask. Uh, he was also probably a little bit short on body size. And you can see she was a long bodied hen with width in the shoulder. This was the result. One of uh, the most successful and my exhibition budget regards that we have ever, ever shown. A little bit unlucky uh, on the show bench, but certainly a bird that uh, was admired by all. You can see the combination of the features I described there. So she's inherited the mother's depth of mask. She's inherited the father's blow and capping and she has a beautiful body feathering there. A super stylish bird and perfect for the exhibition. These are some sisters which at that time, we're, we're talking about 2010 here, so we're seven years moved on from that. But I think it's a, a good example of a, a pair of birds that's produced very, very well. Outcrossing, so this is the buying of birds. Um, Always a very difficult situation, really, for, for a breeder to uh, look to what they need to bring in. Our system for bringing in an outcross has always been twofold, really. One, we have always gone to the very best. So we started with uh, Moffat birds in Scotland when I was a junior. Jim Moffat was one of the leading breeders in the UK. We then moved on to Frank Silver, who won the World Show in 1999. And uh, then Alan Marchant and Chris Huxley. When we look for an outcross these days, what we do is we assess uh, our own birds and see what they are lacking. Every bird lacks something. There's a fault in every single bird. So what we will do is look for uh, a feature that we are lacking. And then we will look to see who has a lot of that feature in their birds. We will then approach that person and try to obtain an outcross from a line that has that feature in abundance. So this is a bird that we acquired in 2008 from Alan Marchant. 
we probably had better birds in our aviary at that point in time. But what we didn't have is the feature of what I would describe as back skull. This is one that Chris and Alan established in the UK Budgerigar, I would say from, from 2006 onwards. They completely revolutionized the shape of the bird that was being shown here. And this light green, although not a super bird, you could see straight away that it had that uh, back skull feature in proportion to the actual bird itself. This is another bird that we bought uh, a few years ago. Our birds, we felt, were just starting to lack a little bit of spot. And uh, we thought uh, we needed to go somewhere uh, where people had spot feature in abundance. The people in question there were Terry and Linda Dukes from the Midlands, who had some very, very good opalines and opaline cinnamons. And this was a bird that we brought back from there. As you can see, uh, fantastic spot quality. Depth of mask. Now, uh, again, working with the Huxley, uh, uh, Huxley and Marchant line, we made a decision in 2011 that our birds were lacking a little bit of mask. One person who definitely wasn't lacking mask was the partnership of Freakley and Ainley. And we approached Ian Ainley uh, to ask him for an outcross. We acquired the bird on the left, which by any means, I'm not sure many people would be thrilled to have that bird in their aviary. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it has a super depth of mask in comparison to um, uh, the other birds there. That bird was brought home. It was paired to a uh, very well uh, bred and super visual uh, golden faced cinnamon gray hen. And the bird that popped out was on the right hand side which is the golden face gray cock of ours that won the world show in 2013 and 2014. Now, obviously the bird on the right is far, far superior to the bird on the left, but you can see remarkably on those two photos that the feature has been achieved, the depth and width of mask. It's almost a like for like uh, placement across the two birds. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're trying to bring in an outcross. You're trying to bring in a feature this is a hen uh, which uh, sadly passed away when it was about 10 months old, but never mind, that's butchery of gas. Uh, this is a feature of power, and uh, this bird was bred from an outcross from the stud of Richard and Wayne Bowker from the Stoke on Trent area. Guys who breed birds in a very similar way to what we do super birds in high numbers. And their birds are tremendously powerful across the shoulder, in the face. And straight away, in the first time that we were experimenting with their lines crossed into ours, this was the result. And uh, it's that, that line has continued to play a huge part in what we're doing right now. Setting goals. Now, it's, budget of ours is a long game. So if anyone has the ambition to come in straight away and be winning the world show in two years time, then I wish you all the best. Uh, and you may get there, but I don't think that's either an achievable aim or one that anyone should be taking on board. Set yourself a goal and do that every season. So when I say set a goal, set one when you're pairing your birds up, set one when you're assessing your surplus stock, and set one when you're sourcing your outcrosses from other breeders. So when I'm talking about assessing your, your own stock, Look for one feature that you are looking to develop or to instill or fix in your birds. So, for example, the bird on the left there, a golden face spangle of ours, tremendous directional feather across the brow. That's definitely a feature that we would want to fix in our birds. And when we're selecting breeding pairs, we would look for as many birds in our stud that either carry that feature or had it in their background. And we would have them used in our breeding team throughout the season. At the same time, this is an old photo, but actually, when this bird was sorted, uh, this bird had actually sold. And the reason for that was, despite the fact that it showed, uh, at the time, very good depth of mask and uh, a lot of blow on the head, it lacked back skull. It didn't have the back skull feature, and it didn't have it uh, in, in quite a severe way. So despite that bird having qualities in other departments, we had to be ruthless. 
and work to, to um, get rid of that feature. So when we're assessing our surplus stock, we bear in mind a feature that we're trying to reduce, whether it be flecking, whether it be uh, lacking back score, whether it be short of mask. Those are the things that we're taking into consideration depending upon the aim that we're working on at that period in time. It's very important to have vision, so an aim as to what you're looking at next. The bird on the right is uh, a bird from Daniel Lutolf, I believe. And Daniel here has achieved something which I think uh, is, is absolutely fantastic, actually. If you look at the, the triangle shapes on the left, I think this depicts what I would describe as the original keyhole exhibition budgerigar. So the mask uh, coming up to the middle of the face under the beak uh, and then going out from the beak up to the top of the head. What you've seen now is essentially the bird on the right, which is much more width in the middle of the head across the brow and the thickness carrying up into the top of the head. But where the real future lies, I think, in terms of where the birds are going, is the line that you would draw from the top right hand of the uh, triangle down to the bottom right hand of the triangle. And it's filling in that gap with feather. That's where the future uh, lies, producing the complete face. So filling in the gap from the brow down to the mask. Um, and if you look at the bird there from Daniel, you'll see he's almost achieved that completely, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think that's uh, a feature that we can all be looking to uh, achieve uh, in the future. Now I'm going to show you some pictures for, of some birds of ours and uh, I'm, going to say, I'm going to apologize, I'm going to say sorry because in some quarters in this hobby my father and I are criticized for having old-fashioned birds, that uh, our birds are not with the times and uh, that we are behind other people, all the rest of it. So I'm just apologizing now for the birds that you're about to see because if you don't feel they're good enough or whatever uh, then you have my apology in advance. So you'll see some of these birds in the aviary, and I will uh, talk through them in more detail then. But the grey family is obviously very prominent in our birds. You'll have seen the pictures and videos on YouTube. And these are some pictures that were taken in the summer of 2016. So this was a grey cockbird that uh, won his class at the Budgerigar Society World Championship show as a young bird. Super feather, great blow, and the directional feather all in the right place. That's the same bird from a different angle. This is another bird. Uh, he actually was at the World Show last year and was placed seventh in the class. Some people argued he should have been further up the lineup, but we had five in the first seven, so we weren't complaining too much. This guy has actually been a super breeder for us as well, producing some fantastic young birds, uh, both last season and this season. You can see the extreme uh, directional feather in the head combined with the blow, and a very, very important bird to us. This is another bird. Now, um, the directional feather on this guy is a little bit more old-fashioned than perhaps some of our modern birds. But look at the beautiful tucked-in beak. Uh, that's a feature that I think is forgotten about a lot these days. And also look at the general style and prowess of the bird. A really, really fabulous show bird and one that is now a breeding cage now, paired to a hen with a lot more directional feather, hopefully complementing his features with hers. That's the same bird from different angles. That's another grey. Now what you will often see in UK budgerigars is the feature they describe as blow, which is the ability for a bird to push its feathers forward. Uh, uh, some birds you will see, uh, fantastic birds, but actually they're quite flat-headed, there's no movement in the feather. And I think that the blow is actually a, a, a key part of a modern exhibition bird. Same bird from a different angle. This guy is uh, slightly flecked, which is a, a downside, but it's just something you have to work with. But you'll see he has uh, very, very powerful, uh, large, wide spots. This guy is also in the breeding cage and producing some exceptional youngsters this season. Again, this is a bird that uh, is not as extreme as some of those that we have, 
but has the nice tucked in beak and also has the directional feather and fan effect in the head feather. Uh, he has been paired uh, this year to a more extreme uh, opaline grey hen carrying flecking to enhance his sport feature. Same bird from different angle. This guy is a, a huge budger guy, which I've actually got in the showcase for you in the ogre, which I'll show you. The downside is he's flecked, but pretty much everything else um, is, uh, is pretty good. Now, this grey guy is one bird probably that we are excited about. This photo was taken when he was six months old, but he's matured a lot more now. His face is much fuller, and he's trying, he has that square boxy face that we are now trying to fix in all of our birds with the eventual aim of filling and completing the face altogether. This bird was uh, one of the greys that was featured in the World Championship Show class that I referred to earlier. Super, super bird that is producing some great youngsters this year. One particular feature that I like about this guy is the, the layers of feather in the head. You can see that he has the blow, uh, but there are layers and layers, so it's actually a more compact feather structure than what some of our other birds are. Our yellow face line, uh, again, probably well documented on Facebook recently, but one that originates back to Alan Marchant and continues to, to grow in our every year on year. This guy won best of color at the World Championship show last year and was looked at for best in show. Complements many features, super style in the breeding cage, blow, directional feather, tucked in beak. This other chap is probably one of the most important birds that we have in the breeding cage at the moment. He produced one of the best birds we've ever bred last year, a normal gray cock. And actually, I'll show you in the Avery in my hand. I think he's probably one of the most balanced birds, top end birds that we have in the Avery. Yellow face sky blue, one of our mo most popular colors in our stud. Um, this is actually a, an older bird, but he's still breeding. Uh, he's 2013. He's probably the exception to our rule of using youngsters, simply because everything this chap breeds is normally a very, very top-end bird. This is a bird bred through the Bowker line. Um, as you can see, wide, powerful budgerigar with fantastic depth of mask. Uh, this bird also bred through the Bowker line, probably carrying a lot more body feather than what we would like. We like our birds to be much tidier than this. But one feature that he does have, of course, is the fantastic depth of mask, which is probably... Uh, slightly better than the average across our stud. Dark factors. Uh, Uma over uh, in your country has uh, one or two very, very nice ones popping out I see this year. This is a colour that we've been famous for for many years now and uh, one that we still have a little bit of a, a soft spot for. So this is a violet cock who actually won his class at the World Championship Show this year and was second in the uh, best of color lineup. Probably one of my favorite exhibition birds actually, combining um, the modern feature, the directional feather, but beautiful glow and style and body feather. And that violet color is extremely striking. This is a cobalt who's actually in the breeding cage uh, right now, and I'll be able to show you him later. Probably one of the most influential birds in our stud. Um, he was one of the first to have the real extreme directional feather you can see there and the tucked in beak, um, which is very, very important. He also has super spots, which I think can also be looked over and missed um, when you're looking at birds sometimes. Opaline cobalt, probably a little bit buffer feather than what we like to go with. Um, he, when paired, it was put to a much typier uh, breeding hen, but look at the spot quality, look at the feather quality, really super bird to be using. This guy is in the breeding cage, um, and also I'll show you him in the, in the Avery. He's a really uh, balanced bird uh, for what I would describe as a modern show budget regard. Directional feather, depth of mask, and uh, very compact feathering in the head. That's him from a different angle. You'll see he has both blow and compact feathering, which is quite rare. Many people try to achieve that, and not many succeed. Dark green, needs more directional feather, but just look at the depth of mass there. That's certainly a feature that I would like to have across the whole stud. Our cinnamons, 
These originate from a Richard and Wayne Bowker line. Uh, this is a bird I featured in an earlier slide. Directional feather uh, and body feather are probably the key features of this particular line. And uh, this guy is uh, uh, breeding as we speak and producing some exceptional cinnamon grays and blues. Cinnamon sky blue. This guy actually won a best in show two years ago. Not particularly um, extreme, but very, very, very balanced and certainly a very useful bird in the breeding cage. A normal cinnamon grey cock, uh, a bit not as quite as pretty as what I would describe uh, some of our birds, but um, certainly uh, a very useful bird in the breeding cage. Cinnamon cobalt cock. Uh, probably one of the biggest birds we've ever bred in terms of length of budgerigar. You can see the length above the perch, uh, really super bird, and has been very, very influential in the establishment of our cinnamon line in the Avery. Again, note the balance and style of the bird. This is, this is a, a proper exhibition budgery, not just a big bunch of feathers that sits on the perch. Cinnamon Grey Cock, uh, this guy won Best of Colour at the Wor uh, World Championship show uh, this year. One bird that's very, very fertile indeed, and uh, you will see him in the breeding cage uh, later in the presentation. Our Grey Green Line. This is one that I think is really starting to get going uh, at this moment in time. You'll see on this bird, different type of head feather, um, almost like a spiky directional blow. Super spot quality. Um, unfortunately, we lost that bird about a month ago, but uh, thankfully we have a lot of youngsters from him. This is one of my favorite birds that we've bred as an exhibition bird. He's never actually made it to a show. He's always dropped a tail or dropped a flight or something that's prevented him from being shown. He's actually currently on loan to uh, Richard and Wayne Bowker, who we've uh, done a swap with, and uh, I believe he's breeding some some really nice stuff down there as well. So uh, that's that's uh, excellent when it can work like that. Our sky blue line, you'll see some babies in the show cages in a moment. This is a bird from last year, 2015 run. What I would describe as a carrot top budgerigar. Great blow and shape of face, and uh, really like the depth of mask on him combined with the spot quality. Another bird, same family, uh, probably slightly better directional feather and thicker in the, the middle of the head compared to the previous bird. And uh, this bird is in uh, cage 37 down in Avery number two this year. Our spangle line, a little bit less known than uh, some of our other mainstream colors, but the double factor here uh, won his class at Doncaster this year and uh, secured the opposite sex award beaten by a super double factor yellow hen. This is a spangle sky blue who won best of color at the world show this year. He's in the breeding cage and I'll show you in a second uh, him uh, on the live feed. Uh, another double factor, uh, full brother to the bird featured previously. This is a spangled cobalt bird, uh, very, very long in terms of uh, from, from head to toe of, of, of the show cage, um, and one of probably the most fertile birds that we have at the moment. He bred 32 chicks last year. So my final thoughts on this part of the presentation before we go into the Avery, I'm just going to just run over one or two points. So what motivates us? Because we get asked this quite a lot, actually. We've won the Budgerigar Society World Championship show three times now. So some people say, why don't we just uh, pack up and uh, enjoy our retirement? Well, I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into what motivates us. Success. So a lot of people judge you by your most recent 
year on the show bench, well, you know, success comes and goes. You can be very, very unlucky. It just t- takes a bit not to sit on a perch during a key moment in judging or a, a show team to fall to pieces the week before a major show. So I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, winning on the exhibition side is uh, our, our key motivation. It's very nice when it happens, but no, I wouldn't. This is a, a trophy hall that we brought back from the World Show uh, a few years ago. And uh, nice to have, but not necessarily what drives us. A lot of people say it's all about the money with the Millers. They're, they're only interested in money, and that's, that's, that's it. Well, it's not, actually. Um, for one thing, the scale of the setup that we have, two aviaries, um, the, the feeding regime that we have, uh, the, the inputs that we put into the birds and the money that we put back into the fancy. Um, you, you don't have much change out of that, quite frankly. So these are an idea of some of our fixed costs in terms of uh, what we put into the birds every year. And that's before we even go and buy an outcross, um, before we travel all across the UK doing what we do, uh, and before we buy everyone a, 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 a drink at the Budget Grass Society World Show when we enjoy that weekend. Is it fame? Is that what we're looking for? Um, well, it's not really. I, I only joined Facebook uh, on the budget side in May of 2016. I probably came to it quite late in the game. Uh, and here is a picture that is taken from the Budget Grass Society World Show. It's, you'll see it's a bit like a roll, roll of honour. So the birds on the, on the top are ones that have won the World Championship Show. So that was our Violet Hen in 2006. And then in the bird uh, that, that won it for us after that was the golden face that won it twice. So we've won it three times now. Uh, the guys on the bottom are what we call club show legends. So people who are sadly no longer with us, but who have made a huge impression on the hobby. Um, do we want to be famous? No, we don't. That is not our key aim. We enjoy being successful, but no, we don't want to be famous. So what does motivate us? Well, one key thing for us is the retreat. Um, I'm a, a partner in a successful law firm in the northwest of England. I have uh, some property businesses in my own right. On top of that, I manage the family commercial property business. My father is self-employed. He runs a commercial property business, a poultry washing contract business, a car washing business. So we have extremely hectic lives. And one of the biggest uh, parts of our enjoyment from budget regards is the ability to retreat into our aviaries of a night time and just focus on the birds, completely switch off to everything else that uh, is going on out there. And it's, it's quite a wonderful thing that we enjoy together. The other motivation uh, are the places we go. And I, I hope one day to uh, visit Pakistan and see you all in person. But this is a picture taken uh, a few years ago and it's Malibu Beach, California. And it was taken by the chap who was showing me around over there. And I was lucky enough to be invited by um, uh, some fancies over there to judge the show in California. And I spent 10 days out there. And it was a real surreal moment for me when I sat on Malibu Beach and I laughed to myself that what had taken me um, from wet, cold England over to Malibu Beach, California, was that little thing called a Bojriga. So... Uh, uh, it's great to see the places that we can visit as part of our wonderful hobby. And also the people that we meet. Um, there are some unpleasant characters out there, but there are in every walk of life. We have been very, very lucky to establish friends across the UK and now across the world through our wonderful hobby. So the people we meet is a key motivation for us. This is where I live in the UK. It's, it's home and uh, it's a place I love very much. And the reason I featured this is just to explain something to you. It didn't always look like this. It was a complete wreck and it was renovated painstakingly by my father and the building contractor. And there was lots of stress and hassle involved and it was a real uh, hard project to go through. Unfortunately, as it neared completion, the house next door uh, caught fire and uh, that fire spread or, or into my side of the house. Now, this, so the guys in the front here are the, the firemen putting the fire out. 
the, the two chaps there stood at one of my best friend and one is my father. Uh, this came at a very, very difficult time in my life. I was having um, uh, some relationship problems. I was having a real stress at work and I was at a particular low ebb. So when this fire took hold, it was pretty much the final straw, really. And uh, I wasn't on this picture. I was probably on my hands and knees on the right-hand side of, of the photo, thinking what on earth could happen next. So things were not great. The next photo, as you can see, is me being presented with a fire extinguisher. Now, the reason why I featured this photo is because if you had told me that six days earlier when my, fire, my house was on fire, that I would have a huge smile on my face and that I would be laughing, I wouldn't have believed you. But the reason I was able to do that was that a very close friend of mine in the budgie hobby who's no longer with us had arranged for me at my very first judging engagement in the United Kingdom to be presented with a fire extinguisher. And as you can see, the smile is back on my face. So isn't it wonderful that someone who I met through budgie regards was able to have that effect on me? Okay, that's the end of this part of the presentation. I'm going to log off uh, from the PowerPoint now and uh, I will retreat back into the Avery and we will try and get uh, things set up from there. All right? Kashif, can you hear me? Great. All right. So, um, I'm going to hand the phone over to my father who can film me. But first, I need to introduce this guy because he doesn't get as much credit as I did. So this is my father, Michael. Um, he, as I say, is uh, a stocksman, lifelong stocksman, farmer, and uh, we've been in partnership now in Budgery Guys for a long time. So I'm going to uh, just swap the camera around so Dad can film me uh, while I show you guys around the Avery. Okay? So you look at that All right. Okay, so you've heard it before, guys. Um, these are the, the flights. So the two-third half-flight design. Uh, modern birds, we don't think, actually want to be in a huge flight. They want to be in an aviary so they can fly sufficient distance so they can get exercise. So we don't have huge flights. Key benefits to a flight of this size is you can go at this level. The birds aren't startled by you. They're not flying around all over the place. Also, you can see things. Nothing's hiding away in any corners. So we don't really lose birds in the flights. What we do is that we have um, the ability to see when things are right. We can pick a bird out of the aviary. And uh, we can medicate it or whatever. Also, if you look at the top of the flights, they have short perches that allows the birds to get used to sitting individually on a short perch. Very important for show cage separation. All right. These are the breeding cages, which I mentioned before. Um, so here's a, a nest of youngsters. I'll explain the product that we use in their trophy beds in a second. But essentially, simple design, box in a box, healthy, vibrant youngsters. Um, another key feature in the Avery are uh, what we call the Renticill strips, okay? Now you can, or Renticill cassettes. These are, um, I'll show you over here. You have these spaced out through the entire Avery. What they achieve is they kill all flies, mosquitoes, moths, etc. So there's nothing coming into the aviary. What we find is that moths can bring, in particular, can bring a lot of disease and mite. Um, so it's very important that you get those under control. <laughs> um, we will now step down into the other part of the aviary. So here you will see what we call the young bird aviary. I've talked about before. So all the babies um, come down from uh, uh, breeding fairs here and in Avery number two. And this is where they essentially start their, their journey. Okay. They move from there into the first baby flight, which is here. As they break into their first mold, they go into uh, flight number two. They finish the first mold in flight number three. 
And that's the first point of assessment that we will make. We will look to see what we're going to be keeping, what we're going to be letting go. That will be the first point they looked at. Then they move around to flight number four, flight number five, flight number six is where they get paired. All right? So that gives a back, bit of background to it. Now then, to talk through uh, the pair, some of the birds that we have, we've seen pictures and videos. Um, this is just to give you some, some live pictures. So these are actually some greys that are breeding right now in Avery number one. In total, we have approximately, I would say, 90 uh, visually very, very good grey cockbirds that are breeding right now, or rather waiting to be paired up as well in the, in the, in the spare flight. That guy in particular, as you can see, pretty extreme in his directional feather, super spot, uh, a real winning bird. These are some birds that are just either not quite ready for pairing up or getting to a stage whereby they might be. This fella is uh, approaching six months old now. Again, you can see the shape, the blow, the directional feather all coming there. And uh, one that we're quite excited about. This is a guy that's just finished his first round of breeding. Um, one bird that we're particularly excited about for uh, the show bench next year. But the greys are probably one of the most consistent families that we have in the Avery. And they're not all identical, they have different features, different qualities, but uh, they are what you would describe as extremely consistent. Now, some sky blues. These are all 2016 run. I'm just going to move on onto a perch. So sky blue. He's just into his first round of breeding. This guy is five months old. Same with this one here. One of the spangles here. That's the Spangle Sky Blue. Super depth of mask and uh, really strong Spangle markings actually on that one. Spangle Sky Blue that won the world at the CC at the World Championship show this year. 2016 Spangle Sky Blue. Probably about nine months old now. Compromised of uh, style, quality of feather, uh, and blow in the top of the head. Moving on now to the Dark Factor family. This guy isn't what I want to see on the first, but as you can see, as all the, the facets of a, an exhibition bird that you want to see, there's no feather depth of mass. A really, really nice bird to look at in the show. Too. Double back to yellow. So this is the guy that won the uh, best of color at the World Championship show. Best of the color this year. This is actually his son, who doesn't like sitting on the first very much. But uh, he did do his second round of breeding now. Again, you can see the head quality, the depth of mass. Overall, a really super bird. Two thousand and sixteen yellow faced sky blue cock. Um, he is into his second round of breeding now, doing exceptionally well. And as you can see again, good balance of features that we're talking about, the directional feather, style. This is a bird that we don't see a lot of in our Avery, but uh, when we do, they're usually not bad. This is the light green 2016 wrong, coming up to six months old now. Real blow on his top end and uh, directional feather. 
yellow face grey. This is one I've taken some pictures and videos of, of lately. Still a baby, still maturing. So as you can see, some key features and qualities there of exhibition birds we like to see. This is one of my favourite birds at the moment, just in terms of the head feather quality. So this is a golden face, sky blue. The beauty about a golden face is that it diffuses the body colour, so you get this wonderful, almost like turquoise green colour. And uh, he's one that we're really excited about uh, having paired up. This is one that uh, a lot of people are very excited about, which is the anthracite uh, style of bird that we have at the moment. So we only have four of, uh, of these guys in the uh, whole aviary. This is an uh, anthracite, maybe yellow face. Um, anthracite usually out of this quality, but uh, this guy has huge potential, still a baby. Uh, not yet old enough for the breeding cage, but a really, really super bird. Baby Grey Green. He will probably, after I finish the presentation today, find a suitable head for him and pair him up. We might even find a head for him during the presentation so I can show you the type of head I would match him to. Yellow face cinnamon grey. Youngster, again, uh, classic yellow face family, lovely stylish bird, heaps and heaps of blow. Now, can anyone guess what colour this bird is? It's not a normal grey, it's uh, our winning anthracite cock. He uh, hasn't actually bred anything in the first round with the hen he's with, so we're going to let him go for a second round and fingers crossed he does something there. But again, as a, an anthracite, pretty, pretty special. This is a great cock. I think he's one of the earliest slides. He has the third round of breeding now. We've actually changed the hen, we've had him with a normal pride hen and we've got enough pride now, so we've put him with a different style of hen. Sky blue cock. 2016 run and probably one of my favourite birds. Incredible directional feather and if we look back at the slide edge earlier where I mentioned about filling in the gap at the side of the side of the face. That's pretty much as close as you can get to a complete face. Another really important bird, this is the guy that won the best of colour at the World Championship show this year. Yellow face, normal grey cock. Um, I mean what there is much to not like about this guy really. Uh, really great directional feather. And you know uh, great style of bird. This is probably my favourite bird in the Avery, just because I think he complements everything we're trying to achieve in the modern bird. He's big, he's balanced, he's not too extreme, he's clean, he has fantastic spots, and he's really some of our top, top birds right now. That's the sky blue from the breeding cage. Won his class at the World Championship show this year. Um, father of ring number one, 2017. So, I'm probably going to move on to now talking about uh, some uh, ancillary points, okay? So, you've, you've seen the Avery, you've seen the breeding cages that we use, and the style of nest box. I'm just going to talk through one of the products that we use. So, this is a product called Tropibed, T R O P I B E D, right? Now, what it is, it's ground up coconut shell, okay? So, they use it all around the world to grow exotic plants and things like that. 
We use it in the nest boxes. The reason why, the fibers on the top, they're nice and dry, just with sawdust wood. But below it stays moist, which is great for um, hatching eggs and rearing chicks. But also, the nest boxes don't smell. The hens nest a lot better with it. And we reckon that's enhanced our uh, activity rates by about 20%. So it's a really important product, and I would recommend anyone trying to, to, to source that. All right? I'm going to switch the camera around now. Someone else can take a picture of me while I'm doing it. Oh. One of the key things, I think, is picking the right hen. So, a lot of people... will go crazy for hens like this. Alright? They will say, tell me, tell me the super hen, tell me the absolute top hen. Well, I can tell you this hen. The hen will lay two eggs, and then eight two of them. Never laid an egg after that. It is completely useless. It's an ornament. So the hens that really excite me are actually hens like this. Okay? Or blind grey hen. Bred from one of the best grey cocks we own. Yellow faced sky blue cinnamon hen. Bred from one of the top yellow face cocks. Stylish, spangled, sky blue yellow face hen. Not extreme, balanced, well bred, no massive faults. Grey hen. Boxy, tighty hen. That will do the breed, okay? I'm going to give you some examples of suggested pairings, because this is really. Where a top bird man comes into the door, the ability to match one bird to another. Anyone who thinks that simply getting the best bird they can possibly buy, pairing it to the best bird they can possibly buy, will produce them the dog, he's killing themselves. Because all that will mean is that the top bird sits on the bloody body will do the richest men. That is the case. It's the men who have the talent, the brain, and the ones who are willing to learn. Alright? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to match those four hens to the four top cocks in this case. Alright? So let's start with this one. I so it's probably as extreme as we want to go in terms of better quality. Okay? So, what would we suggest pairing that bird to do? Well, he, if he, we could fault him, we could say that he is ever so slightly flecked. Um, it's not the prettiest bird in the showcase, he's sitting okay at the moment. But you need something um, uh, much more stylish. And also, you could fault it by saying it's a little bit short in body. Okay? So, the hen that I think would complement him is this yellow face, sky blue cinnamon, length of body, clean head. Okay, so that would be a match pair that I would put together. Very, very complimentary. Extreme, bear to well-bred type. Now the benefit is, I'll get three to four rounds out of that hen, he'll fill most of the eggs, and I'll probably get the desired results because the pedigrees match it. All right? Let's pick another one. Sky 
Nigel Cock. Really great modern fixtures. 2016 wrong. You're going to fault him ever so slightly, so probably just do a little bit more depth here. The beautifully clean, all the right set of features. The fantastic six spot that we're aiming to do. Picking a mate for him. I'd go for this hand. Yes, she's flecked, but she has great depth of mask in proportion to her head. She has the same spot quality as the cock, so you're not going to lose anything there. And more importantly, this hen is bred from this cock. Okay? So top end cock produces well bred hen match features. And that for me is a very, very complimentary pair. Again, I'm not going for super buff massive hens like the spangle and I'm gonna breathe any chips. I'm going for stuff that's going to produce me three to four rounds with four and five kicks in every net. That's what we're aiming for. All right. Another example. Sky Blue Cup, as I mentioned before, probably one of the most modern birds that we have. Beautiful face. Okay, let's look at what we don't like. For me, the spots could do with improving and maybe pulling the mask down just a little. Okay. So I would go for something like this, normal grey hen, the quality she has is the quality he's lacking, so the spot, she's a feature we've been working on really hard to breed, she has better depth in mass proportion to her size of body, and also I'm not much of a man for colour preferences, but actually sky blue to grey is one of my favourite pairings. So that's another pairing. Next. Two thousand and sixteen. Great cock. Really, really super bird. Probably for me, I would just like to see a little bit more, maybe depth of mass there, and maybe a little bit of stars just in the breeding cage, in the cell cage rather. But to be honest, we really are taking thought to be the kids with these top end birds. Obviously, that's a pretty outstanding drop. But I'm going to put in with just a complimentary hand like that. Nothing terribly exciting about the sweet breeding head.
as I say, trying to achieve balance and the pairing that's going to work in the breeding stage. All right. One of the key things that I think we've lost in our hobby is that we are trying to breed exhibition birds. All right. So those are birds that you can breed with, that you can prepare for a show, and you can get on a show, and you can win a show with. That's very different to a Facebook breeder. Okay. You know, I can breed birds all day long that have massive heads, <laughs> wonderful and extreme and all the rest of it. Okay. So this, this is a Facebook picture, and everyone will go, wow, how amazing and fantastic that is, okay? That bird has no body weight, it's all feather, it more than likely will not do it. And if it ever, ever reaches a shell bench, I will personally give it to you. It is useless as a shell bird, okay? So, what we try and do is an exhibition bird. That's a bird that you can physically get into a shell cage, that you can prepare, and that one that will win. Okay? The birds like this gray here, I think, are uh, nearing pretty much as far as you can go with an exhibition bird. Alright? Anything more extreme? Bigger, wider, longer, whatever you want, is going to be problematic. Okay? So when we try and breed birds, we try and breed healthy birds with high power. Expedition birds, not just straight up ones. I've gone through the map pairing. I'm going to talk a little bit about flecking, because fleck birds, a lot of guys say, oh, you know, we don't we want, we want have fleck birds in the air, we, 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 we only use the head birds. If you only have keen headed birds in your area in your breeding program, over a period of years, you will completely lose your spot quality. And that's what we did with it, because when we started working with the and Martin birds, we um, bred more flecking into our birds, okay? So we worked for years and years to clean the flecking, clean to clean, clean to clean all the time. And what we found was we lost a few lots of spot quality. So using flecking and fleck headed birds, is a vital part of the, the ability to breed super, super floppy birds, which we now have in a vast number of our birds in the area. Okay? So I'll show you one example of a head that people say, I wouldn't use flecking, I don't like that. This hen is flecked. Absolutely flecked. But this hen is also blessed with absolutely fantastic spot. So anyone who says that flecking isn't linked to spot, or that you should eradicate flecking from your stud, I'm sorry, but I totally disagree. Because if you take spot quality like that, and you place it on to a super, super bird like the grey green you're looking at there in the slice, that's why you need flecking. Now you control flecking by pairing a bird that is flecked to clean and then making sure the pedigree of the bird you fed who is also clean, but not one that is fed from the stream infected. Alright? So flecking is a fault, but it needs to be used. Okay? Another thing that I um, get sometimes is people say about spangles, so I don't like spangles. So I'm going to tell you some spangles. These guys are a little more relaxed now compared to what they were before. Now, I learned this from Frank Silver. Frank was a master of feather engineering, okay? Now, what he did was, he appreciated that spangles, on average, have a more enhanced body feather quality than your normal, okay? So what he did was, he integrated the spangles into the breeding program to put feather on the birds. And he was absolutely right. That's why he was so successful in the late 90s in the United Kingdom. He was the first to really appreciate that. So even if you don't like spangles as a colour and you don't really appreciate them and their markings or that thing, just put up with them a little bit in using your breeding program. Because you need guys like this with the feather they've got to put the feather onto your normal. Very, very important part of the breeding really program as far as I'm concerned. Another question I get asked a lot is about free potency. So as I say, people um, buying birds, you always look for something great and something fantastic. Well, 
the reality is most operators aren't going to tell you that. Because why would they? They worked 30 years to build up this super set of birds. Why are they going to tell you that that's good? Especially if they're very comfortably financial. There's absolutely no incentive to just tell you that that's good. So what you're actually looking for are very well-bred birds that are pre-potent to breed super birds. And I'll give you some examples of that, okay? So, This is a super bird. Cobalt. One that I featured in one of my slides earlier. Wonderful directional feather, fantastic spot, and it breeds for fun. Now, not only does it breed for fun, but what it breeds, even if it doesn't look very good, is pre potent, as in it will breed something fantastic, even though it doesn't look that way. And I'll give you an example of a son that Dan and I have decided that we're going to keep as opposed to put in the surplus cage, alright? This is his son. Right? Now he's a nice bird. He's by no means a top bird. He's not an extreme bird. And he probably isn't as good as many of the breeding cocks that we will use. But because he is the son of that bird, I know he is pre potent to breed super stuff. And that's very important because an average bird, bred from a super bird, is far more valuable than a good bird, but from a rubbish bird, as far as I'm concerned. Okay? <coughs> numbers. So we've talked about breeding really numbers. There are 48 breeding cages in this, in this uh, aviary. There are 48 breeding cages in aviary number two. I used the analogy before of slot machines. I spend hours and hours matching these pairs. Okay? So I look at their pedigrees, I look at their visual qualities, and I do my very best to manage the probability of breeding something fantastic. Okay? This guy here is a stockman. He's not meant to be in charge of pairs. Alright? So I go on holiday to Iceland, looking at the Northern Lights, and the hen dies while I'm away. So this guy changes one of the super hens that I've picked and he changes it for something that I don't like very much. He changes it for this hen here. Okay? This hen has no backstore. It is short in mass. And I don't like it very much. Okay? So that cock there. There are 96 breeding pairs. Uh, guess which pair has got the best young school in round one? That pair. Alright? That's what I say. Both of you breeding pairs are like slot machines. All you're doing is managing the probability. All I'll say to that is do it again. So the next time it probably won't work out. So it just shows you, and that's actually what's wonderful about the hobby, the fact that a guy can come to one hand and pair together and do some super good. That's fantastic, and that's what makes it wonderful. All we're doing is by having 48 ready pages here, 48 ready pages down there, is that we're managing the probability and we're increasing our chances of producing super good. That's what it's all about. It's not about producing birth to sell or anything like that. It's producing it's increasing our good chances. All right? What I would also talk about as well is um, how do you establish a sort of bird? Because it's very, very difficult, you know, starting from scratch or, or just looking at how to improve things. And I mentioned it before, we've always got the top guys. So in my early days in the hobby, we went to Tim Moffat in Scotland, who was world famous for his life Then we went to uh, Frank Silver, then we went to Alan Mark. So always try and work with the top guys, or try and work with the guys who are working with the top guys, just try to get something from them. And if I was just giving any more advice to start off with, it would be this. I would stick with one or two breeders, whoever they are, just see someone on a show or in an aviary, if you like the look of their birds, okay? Try and get a couple of mass pairs from both of those breeders. Try and also find out whether those breeders' lines work together, because some pedigree lines work great from those. 
take those few months there, read some of the stop them all. So, um, the plan is really on to the end of the first three years of reading, and then you can start out to the top of it. It's really, really important to build your own foundation stock, and you want to build foundation stock on things that you can do there and everywhere. Find the right people, stick with them, work with them, and try and get their match there. So there's no point trying to mess around with their parents. I know my girl is better than anyone else. If you don't find someone coming from me or something like that, telling me uh, how to sell them, okay? So it's a really important part of our thing. What I would also like to talk about is Facebook. The Facebook is wonderful, um, and the internet actually. Um, Facebook is a wonderful part of the hobby, and I wouldn't be speaking to you guys right now if it wasn't for Facebook. So I'm really grateful for that. But be careful with Facebook, because Facebook can create what I would describe as overnight celebrities. Bobby Green does his acting powers for eight years ago. And the team that my dad and I have enjoyed a tremendous amount of success. And we have done a lot of work of the industry in the past few years. But there are some people who are able, because of their presence on Facebook and the internet, to be able to create a persona that is far bigger than they've ever achieved. There are people giving you guys messages and giving you guys advice. You have never run the program, never will run the program. There are some super brings in the UK, and there are some great guys out there, but be very careful that the old might be the old system that has them. Okay? It's not free, but you want to work with you. You can win on the filter. Um, on that front, uh, Kelly Seal, uh, I heard you there, and I just wanted to thank you for the, um, uh, the uh, publicity on Facebook the other week, which is greatly appreciated, and I hope that you enjoy this lecture right now. So, just a quick uh, shout out to you. Um, anyone who is visiting the UK, if you get a chance, please, please visit the visit outside the Europe Council because there's only one pack ahead of the uh, It's a great festival for the hobby. People come from all over the world. Jack Titan, Martin Halen, Daniel Lindholm. They're all there taking part in a fantastic weekend. And give you a great, great book of, of viewing software from all across the UK and some of the guys from the company. So if you do get a chance to visit the UK or take part in some of the seminars uh, of seminars online, I uh, really advise you to do so. Okay? Um, I'd also like to say a thank you to Fire UK Winter, who's from Pakistan, who was one of the best talking over there, and I hope that um, the guys that have worked with now on there are, are very happy with what they have. Um, and I was just like to talk about the future for them, man, because, uh, like she would say, we have to win the World Cup three times now. What's our goal? What are we going to try and achieve? Well, our goal is basically to try and continue to improve our world year on year. To be competitive at the very top. Not to win everything, not to win every time, but to constantly try and improve the quality of our and the quality of our world. And more importantly, to enjoy our hobby. To really enjoy what we do, to share it with new people that come into the country and not in which way to spread it. Connor Hickman won the World Show last year with a really the best in working show. That really spread through one of our lives. And that really is a great pleasure to see people come into our hobby, work with our stuff, and be really proud of it. Okay? So, I'm going to bring the end to this part of the presentation, and then I'm going to go back into the house where it's a little quieter, where you guys can ask me some questions, and I can put some answers to you. Alright? So, thank you very much for your attention so far. I really appreciate you taking the time to tune in on Sunday, and uh, we'll speak in a moment. Thank you very much. Uh, any Pleasure. Time? Okay. Uh, uh, with the closing remarks, so we would like to thank you on behalf of FACT in Pakistan. Gujranwala, Faisalabad, and other uh, Australia, Egypt, and other areas. We really thank you for your time, your guidance, and everything for the uh, improvement. Well, that's great, and, and we're uh, willing to see you in Pakistan very soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think 2018. We've said so. Let's let's do that. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity of being able to speak to you today. Thank you. Eight. Thank you on behalf of our entire team. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, we, we really appreciate your time and thank you very much indeed. Thank you for taking the time to do this today. Bye-bye.
I just wanted to say a huge thank you for all of the work and effort that was put in by the Pakistan Agricultural Guild recently in relation to our online lecture. I would especially like to thank the Society President, Uma, and I would like to thank uh, Tashik in the background, who was responsible for all the IT, the audio, and the countless hours of work, uh, making sure that everything was coordinated at his end uh, and uh, with ourselves. Um, I think that it's a great idea that should be replicated across the world with other breeders of Bajaragas so as to share knowledge and intelligence. I would like to thank all of the countries that took part in that lecture, uh, including all of the clubs around Pakistan, uh, USA and in Australia. This is a worldwide hobby and it's wonderful to be a part of that at times. Uh, it's only uh, through efforts from clubs like yourselves and others uh, that we can share information and enjoy our wonderful hobby. So I'd like to wish you all uh, the best of luck for the rest of the breeding season and for the show season as well. Thank you.